Hello there and welcome to the booth here in Milwaukee. Marshall Sutcliffe with Randy Bueller and Ian Duke. And uh, we're down the stretch here, gentlemen. It is time for us to head down to the future match area for round number 14, where we have Yuta Takahashi against Eric Severson. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. Marshall Seckliff in the booth with Randy Bueller and Ian Duke. And we are excited to bring you round 14 coverage. Whew, we're getting down the stretch here, gentlemen. We are starting to uh, envision top eights here if you're sitting down in the feature match area. We've got Yuta Takahashi versus Eric Severson. Let's take a look at our players. There's Eric. Now, Eric is kind of a GP grinder, hasn't had a ton of uh, PT success but he has made two top eights at GPs, mainly in team events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would. He was just barely short of silver last year. Couldn't quite get to the twenty point threshold, but looking to put a nice run together. Now his opponent is Yuta Takahashi, who has. Well, he's been playing for a long time. He's actually got a pro tour top eight under his belt, as, as well as three GP wins, victories. Mm -hmm. Like this guy is a grizzled veteran of the game. And uh, set the stage for us here, Randy, as far as their records. I know that both of these players are 10 and 3 currently. Yeah, they're what actually, does that mean? they're 5th and 6th in the overall standing. So they kind of just need to hold. With three rounds to go, uh, you know, they're, they're close. They need two wins out of the last three rounds to hold on to that is what's going to happen. So the winner here essentially earns themselves a win and in. And the loser is still alive but would need some help on hoping those tiebreakers hold up. Are you anticipating uh, a, a 10 and or a, an X and 4, excuse me, would make it? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, the thing is that the current nine win players, those are the players who can 3-0 to get to X4, they start at 20th. There's only 19 players that, that are in this, you know, less than four losses category right now. So there's going to be a ton of them. It's going to go from, like, you know, 8th to 18th or something, 8th to 20th. Somebody's going to get lucky. Now, what about the matchup, Ian? Uh, have you had a chance to take a look at the deck list for both players? Yeah, so Yuta Takashi is playing uh, very traditional Abzan. We were kind of joking uh, the other day that you know Japanese players are known for bringing kind of rogue strategies <laughs> or these strange brews that nobody else in the tournament is playing. And that's kind of true this time, except that rogue strategy is Abzan. <laughs> it's really um, underrepresented at this tournament. Far fewer siege rhinos than I think many, many players were expecting. Uh, but this is the deck that many of the Japanese are on, and the reason for it is Anafenza the foremost. Yeah, not Siege Rhino, but Anafenza. Yeah. And that. on the flip side, uh, Eric Severson playing uh, a pretty typical um, Dark Jeskai list. He's got a couple Soulfire Grandmasters, which we saw doing some serious work yesterday at the end of the constructed portion. All right, well, Eric kicked things off uh, in, in this particular game with a Mantis Rider, which did get to hit, though it got nailed with an Abzan charm here. And uh, a replacement Mantis Rider hits the table now for Severson. Severson had an amazing start to his tournament yesterday and uh, has held on quite nicely here today to be 10 and 3. He's given himself a bit of a sweat here. Yeah, he was our last 8 and 0, right? Right. And he got to 9 and 0. So, first place all by himself, but has only won one of the last 4. Utah has a lot more experience at this level uh, than Eric Severson does. Again, with the PT Top 8 already on his resume. So the flavor of this matchup, it's, you know, it's going to be similar to the Obzon versus Jess guy we saw from last season with a couple of key differences. Uh, Obzon lost a lot in the rotation. There's no more yeah. Courser, no more Elspeth. Um, it does pick up Gideon, powerful new threat. From He's no Elspeth, Yeah. I mean, Elspeth's ability to just completely take over the game, if the game goes long, is, has not been replaced. That's right. So, you know, we're not going to see the Abzan deck sort of, you know, making it through through the mid game and then kind of establishing control and, and winning the long game necessarily. Uh, it's going to be anybody's game at any, at any point. The other big difference is Dark Jeskai gets a big upgrade in Crackling Doom which is going to be really effective at taking out those big threats like Siege Rhino. Yeah, we've seen that the uh, mana bases in Standard have become very flexible. And by the way, here comes Gideon, ally of Zandikar. We mentioned him just a minute ago. You guys were talking about powerful new additions. And, and here he is. And uh, 
What do you make of this here? Uh, Utah has immediately plussed Gideon. So the, to the plus up to five. Yeah, plus ability makes Gideon a creature. He won't be able to attack this turn, of course, since he doesn't have haste. But the reason Yuta did that is to put it out of range of cards like Jeskai Charm that wow. have to deal exactly four damage. Now, it looks wild like Severson had a Rider. plan. Yeah, he had a Wild Slash to take it down to three. Manus Rider attacks Gideon, and that problem immediately solved for Severson, so he's got to be happy about that. Effectively, one card in an attack step he traded for, you know, one, one of Takahashi's better cards. Ooh, speaking of better cards, here's good old Siege Rhino. Even with the new mana bases, and even with a, a bunch of Siege Rhino's friends rotating out, you couldn't keep him out of standard. He's still here. Check out Severson's hand, though. <laughs> he's ready He's ready to go Rhino hunting. <laughs> <laughs> he sure is, Ian. <laughs> he says, is that all you got? And fight into yeah. yeah, that's just going to make that a little bit better, but... Wow. Black, That's white, some red. tasty rhino crackling. <laughs> oh, man. Severson knows what's on the menu. And uh, so far, we've seen a pure attrition game. Now, when it comes down to you play a thing, I play a thing to kill it, and then they kind of repeat, and, and as you see, the dust has settled on no permanence outside of lands on the battlefield here. Yep. How does that end up? Uh, well, does it, it favor one side or the other? It used to be that Obzon would play Elspeth. And you would just always win the grind fest because you would always eventually play Elspeth. Now, though, it doesn't work that way. And I think the edge has actually swung over to the deck which plays Dig Through Time. The Dig Through Time deck now yeah. needs to grind it out in the late part and, and, and in find fact, just what they need. A lot of the Obzons that we saw this weekend were actually blue Obzon decks. <coughs> they added a fourth color because they felt like, yeah, we need some help in the late game. Wow, the threats don't stop here for Takahashi, though. This turn was huge. Again, he played an on offense of the foremost and a hanger back walker on two. So he says, Eric, hey, man, you want to keep answering me for one for one? I'll just play two things. Now, Eric gets to fire off the first Crackling Doom to yep. take out on Offensive, which is, which is nice. That, that, that'll, that'll be a clean hit there. But the next one gets a little bit more awkward with Hangerback Walker. Yeah, he'd love to draw a Silk Wrap is what he'd love to draw. Anything? No, on top? Yeah. Or a Dig Through Time. Wow, update from a back table. Yeah. Paolo just keeps winning. He's paired against Owen Turtenwald this round. Owen, by the way, on X2, only needs one more win to make this top eight. Um, but Paolo wants the one seed. Paolo wants, uh, has not mathematically locked it, because he's Owen's certainly not going to draw with him. So that's a pretty good King of the Hill battle. That is an epic King of the Hill battle. We'll keep you updated on that. And in comes Shambling Vent, one of the new creature lands from Battle for Zendikar. Uh, another key difference uh, 13, 13. in this matchup as compared to last season. You get a um, creature land here. Huge, huge difference. Yep, yeah, the Obzon deck gets a creature land, um, especially uh, kind of as a big reward for staying three colors instead of going to four. Like Randy mentioned, some of the Obzon decks are Obzon plus blue. But the advantage you get uh, with the stable mana base is you get to add creature lands. And they really shine in a sort of a protracted attrition battle like this. Yeah, you, you said it, man. Here they go again. Shambly Vent getting in once again, and this is big hits. Severson's, his life total's falling very quickly. A lot of Ojitai's <laughs> commands in the feature match area today, and a lot of gain for life draw cards happening as well, which is what happens here. Severson, he's got Crackling Doom, <coughs> Jace Land. Another one of our back table matches, Randy, has uh, Ryochi Tamada versus Ricky Chin. They're both at 11 and 2, hey, and Ricky's up a game in his match. That yes. is a win and in. That's a win and in for top eight here. That is a win and in for top eight. Ricky Chin, by the way, has not lost a match at Constructed yet. Oh, jeez. 7 and 0. Oh with green-white Megamorph. Oh, by the way, that means he hasn't lost a match of Constructed in his Pro Tour career. That's Ricky's first? This is, he won an RPTQ, here he is. Yeah, he's from Canada. 7-0 in Constructed, trying to get another Canadian into the <laughs> top eight. And you said it's, uh, it's Ricky that's up a game? Ricky's up a game. You haven't seen a ton of the green-white Megamorph at the top, but he's certainly making it work. All right, here's another Seed Rhino now for Yuta Takahashi, and uh, 
Beavers and says, yep, you made one. Three damage is going to drop Severson yep. down to six. Yep. But wait, there's more. Takahashi not done yet. <coughs> That's right, Eric. Get, get straightened up. Sitting at 10 and 3 late in the day on the PT. Oh, and it was a wingmate rock for the follow-up play for Takahashi. The pressure is mounting in a huge way on Eric Severson. He can use Crackling Doom, which will take out the uh, Siege Rhino here. But that does not solve his problems. Mm -mm. Any two of these things hit Eric next turn, and that's game. He's got a Jace, and he's going to activate it. He's got to find some pretty specific cards, and I don't think he has. Well, he'll get a flashback. So what does he need here? Does he have to go Ojitai's command? To put him himself up to 10 and then only fall to <laughs> 1? He actually dies to a shambling vent in that scenario. All right, so Peter Viren wins over Curry Burkhart in game 1. Those players are at 10 and 3, yeah. unlike the other one that we described a minute ago, which are at 11 and 2. So not quite a clean winning in here. There. No, they're playing to earn a win in <laughs> next round, just like the guys we're watching. Yeah. So this is going to depend on what he draws here. Gain four life draw, go to 10. It's got to be something. Maybe Takahashi will attack Jace. And he passed the turn. Yeah, Takahashi could attack Jace. He also might not animate a shambling vent. These are the things that Eric's hoping right. for. How about both? Yeah. All at you. Uh, you uh, all at you. <laughs> all for you. And he takes it down, Yuta Takahashi, in impressive fashion. Threat, threat, answer, answer, threat, threat, answer, answer. And then he just had more threats in the end than Severson. Yep. Yuta Takahashi up a game. We will be back right after these messages. Outfit your magic collection with the newest Battle for Zendikar accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, play mats, and portfolios in your favorite magic artwork at ultrapro.com. Join the battle! Battle for Zendikar is now available on Magic Online. Explore the new set by signing up for Magic Online at mtgo.com. Welcome back to the Feature Match area here in Milwaukee. We are down the stretch here on day one. Let's take a look at our, well, really two huge names at the table here. Paulo Vitor Domino Rosa versus Owen Turtenwald. And there's an interesting scenario sort of fleshing out here, Randy, in that Paulo has, has only picked up one loss on the whole tournament and has effectively put himself into the top eight, barring something ridiculous. Now, Owen isn't quite in such a luxuri luxurious position here. He's got two losses. Finds himself down a game, but one thing we should note here is that Paulo's on, you know, the the Atarka red deck, which often will win game one, but then face a lot of sideboard type hate in <laughs> game two. So... And it's interesting, with this uh, Atarka red deck, it's almost a combo deck. We heard Paulo compare it to Splinter Twin last night. And it means, though, that it's vulnerable to having all its creatures get killed. So you tend to see people sideboard in just a ton, a ton, a ton of creature removal, spot removal, trade one for one, kill your creatures, and then you have nothing to point that become a men's team or battle rage combo at. Yeah, I've also, uh, you know, I spent some time down in the feature match area for the last couple of rounds, and I also saw that when they got whittled down to just a couple of cards in hand and no threats, those cards became pretty big liabilities. Uh, you know, th their, their opponents would hold up removal spells and or creatures and kind of force the issue, and it really didn't leave a lot of options. So it, this is, in some ways, a get-ahead, stay-ahead type deck. It does have a combo finish if the shields are down, but it feels like once people stabilize against it, you know, this is not a burn-heavy deck. It's not... Right. It, it, it's pretty tough for them to, to just torch you out from, you know, eight or nine. It's dug the flames rotated out. Exquisite Firecraft is not making the cut these days. 
Now, Owen Turtenwald, on the other hand, he's on this dark Jeskai deck that we've been talking about, and we've seen quite a bit. And it looks like he's maneuvered himself into a, a reasonable position here at 10 life, facing no board from Paulo, but with cards in hand for Owen. Mm, Paulo just keeps dashing Zergo. And it looks like a pair of Kolagons command in hand for Owen. Now, the way is clear for him to get rid of Monastery Swift Spear if he'd like. You know, generally the scarier threat, though, on the immediate front, it does mean that he would take an extra damage. I don't believe that Paulo has cards to discard here. At least I can't see them in his hand there. Yeah, so he's going to... Oh, he does have cards, but uh, Owen's going to favor just getting a creature back into his hand anyway. In that case, it was a Mantis Rider. I think he just drew Arish and Cleric, I too. think you're right, Randy. Does not have a fifth land? No. So he's going Mantis Rider. Yeah, Mantis Rider, a reasonable blocker here. Oh, and he can play Tassiger? Oh, wow. wow. Talk about reasonable blockers. <laughs> And PV can do nothing but pass the turn. Mm. And now Owen can gain some life. He can sit on a Kolagon's command. He can attack for seven. <laughs> I mean, that puts Paulo dead next turn. Yeah, and, and this is what we've seen is that, like, if, if Paulo goes for an attack, he could just Owen just blocks, makes him do something, and then can kill. And it looks like... Paulo's going to kind of bring that fight to Owen, though, by playing a Dragon Fodder pre-combat. It's going to get the uh, Prowess Trigger going and enable an attack here. And Owen has Ojatai's command here. That's going to put him back up to 11 and draw him a card. Yeah, things looking very good for Owen Turtonwald here in this game. I, like I said, we have seen combo finishes, but it's rare to happen from this point. Oh, and by the way, Wild Slash will end the game. So Owen Turtonwald wow. even things three. up. It won't be so easy. Now, again, you know, looking at how much weight that match carries for each of our players. It's a much bigger so, deal to so Owen. So much more to Owen. It does. <laughs> like, Paulo's probably thinking about, like, what kind of sandwich he might want nah. after this match. And, and Owen's sweating this. I mean, what what is uh, what does Paulo have to play for as far as uh, finishing out strong here? He wants the one seed. The one seed get because I mean he is. Do playing. you think playing first is good with a target <laughs> red? I sure do. I think, I think he does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that you know if Owen had been also on thirty six points, they probably would have drawn just to mathematically clinch it, and then they can play out the last couple of rounds for the one seed. Um, I don't think the one seed is more important than clinching top eight, but Owen couldn't draw, so yeah, Paulo wants to win next. What are we going to have next round? If Owen wins, we're going to have three players on 36. Probably two of them draw, and the other one has to play. Somebody's playing down. Well, and, and but playing up to the one seed if they win. Oh, right, of course. All right, well, back to our main match here. Remember, Yuta Takahashi took down the first game after just presenting more threats than Eric Severson could answer. And uh, Eric finds himself in a, in a spot where... Coming as the uh, the overnight undefeated player, he's now 10-3 and three and uh, one game away from picking up that fourth loss, which, while doesn't mathematically eliminate him, it does make him much less likely to make top eight and puts him in the danger zone as well, where another loss would mean he's not top eighting. Yeah, his breakers are pretty good, as you'd expect from an overnight leader. But yeah, he hasn't won a round of Constructed today. He 2-1 his draft. Any any uh, anything of note, Ian, on these sideboard plans here uh, from these two decks? You know, they, they have kind of similar game plans. They use a, a different colors, different cards to do it. But uh, what happens post board? So I think both players are going to prepare to play a pretty long, grindy game. They both have plenty of one for one removal and answers to each other's threats. So we'll probably see Severson bring in things along the lines of you know like extra heavy hitters like Tassiger and, and Dragonlord Ojutai. Um, maybe Disdainful Strokes or Valorous Stance, just to answer some of the big threats. On the other side for Takahashi, um, you know, he's got Silk Wraps against Hangerback Walkers. Um, 
painful truths is something that can help him hang in a long game, kind of his own sure. answer to dig through time. Painful truths looks like it would go nicely with a uh, siege rhino as well, help offset that life loss. Definitely. And, you know, we talked about uh, Dig Through Time being a big advantage for the Jeskai deck in those long attrition-based games. We didn't see Eric Severson draw one at all in game one, so mm -hmm. the flavor of this game could be totally different. On the other hand, we also didn't see Yuta Takashi draw any Obzon charms, I don't believe. So that, you know, yeah, his own only card one. engine. Yeah, oh, one, yeah, yeah, and he had to fire it off immediately on a Manus Rider. Right, in removal mode, yeah. Right. So, you know, both players have ways to draw two. Of course, drawing two your top seven a lot better than drawing two random cards, but still, they, they both have ways to hang in the long game. All right, so the attrition battle begins here. Anafenza is put forth by Yuta Takahashi, but Silk Rap takes care of that. He's got a replacement threat, though, Siege Rhino. So things sort of carrying along as normal here from Yuta's standpoint. Severson looks like he's trying to play the control route here as he's trying to manage the threats of Yuta. He's cracking a flooded strand, but really trying to figure out what he should get. This is on end step. <laughs> yeah. But I've seen him look at his hand twice, just going, wait, wait, what do I need again? It's going to puzzle us all. It's four-color decks. I mean, it's uh, tricky to get the mana right in them. It does seem like the mana is good and, and available, but you know, actually playing it out means there's some decision points there. I, I see that he actually went and just got a basic island. Yeah. That means that any of his future battle lands will be coming in untapped. We've got another update from our back table now. We talked a little bit about Ryoji uh, Tamada playing against Ricky Chin. And uh, those are the 11 and 2 players effectively playing a win and in. They're going to game three. So maximum excitement on the back table there. Geez, Severson's hand looks pretty stacked. He's certainly got a lot of action. I mean, the other thing that Severson has that can win him one of those grindy games is Dragon Master Outcast. Oh, right. That thing just starts spitting out 5-5s. Five fives. There's no equivalent threat over on the Abzine side of the matchup. It's a must kill. Yeah, and it comes back with Ojitai's command. Tough turn for Severson here. It, his most proactive threat is the Mantis Rider, but if he plays that, he can't hold up Disdainful Stroke. So he might see a Hangerback Walker plus leaving up Disdainful Stroke. Of course. Look, at, look at you, Ian Duke. Always a little risky. You Just know, calling it. If there's nothing, no opportunity to can't, uh, counter something with this Disdainful Stroke on yeah, the following turn. Yeah, th that he didn't use up his mana super Right, efficiently. especially since he's got a, a pretty um, pretty gassy hand, you know, but he's light on land, so it's going to be a, a struggle for him to deploy all of his cards in time. Now, if you're in Takahashi's seat, how ominous are those two lands there? I think very, um, given the fact that Severson is... He clearly has a full, a full hand, plenty to do, and he didn't spend all of his mana on his turn. You, you've got to imagine he's planning to spend that two other mana some way, and that's either a removal spell, but he doesn't have mana for a murderous cut. Um, Silk Wrap is sorcery speed. So, yeah, Disdainful Stroke is definitely one of the things you're thinking about. And Takahashi's having none of it. He, he's going to play an on offense of the foremost and maybe a two-drop here and just pass the turn back, but he, he is not going to run anything into... Yeah, he had a Tassiger. He, this is him declining the opportunity to play Tassiger. Nice play there for Takahashi. However, that, that is a little bit at the expense of uh, Takahashi's mana efficiency, I think, depending let's, on let's what else he has in his oh, hand. Oh, here we go. Oh, uh, Den Protector oh, face, face up! up. Okay. Ah. He is committed to the cause. <laughs> so that, that's that's seriously playing around Disdainful Stroke. Yes. There. That's like, I'm going to spend all my mana, and I'm going to do it in a way where you can't Disdainful Stroke, even if it means playing this Den Protector face up on turn five. Yeah, wow. he's got a backup Den Protector in hand as well, but that was a great play from Utah. And now Severson is going to have to work his way out of this scenario. This could get touchy for him. He's just going to pass the turn back with that Ojitai's command up. Yeah, no fifth land. <sighs> Wingmate rock off the talk for Utah, who immediately goes to his attack step. Looks like uh, Severson did pick up a copy of Crackling Doom, though, so we'll have one in it, sort of one of those big creatures. Uh, 
How do you play this? Counter on the den protector, so... Well, I think Severson went pre... Hanger back can't block? Before attackers. Yeah, so he's crackling before. Now it's obvious he put it on the den protector. I think he would have done that anyway. Yeah, no thopters. Wow. This is the power of Mana Fenza. Yeah, that's huge. And and Severson, you see that head shake? Yeah, he, shaking he, his he head. He overlooked that. And now the shields are down, and now Yuta Takahashi strikes. Wow, he this has wow. played this beautifully. It's impossible to come back from at yeah, this point. Yeah, he's so far behind. Now, Severson doesn't have sweepers post-board, does he, Ian? Not anything that can deal with this board. I mean, we've seen a lot of these Dark Jeskai decks play things like Radiant Flames to sweep away weenie creatures, but... Um, no you know, planar outbursts in this list. Yeah, I think at some lists at most might play one card like that. Yeah. He also has not hit his fifth land, so. Jeez, this has been a beating. I mean, Severson has like six, seven, six or seven spells in hand here. Takahashi has just sequenced this game better. He has. Takahashi's just flat out played him. He has. All right, we do have our first result in from the feature, mat ta feature match table. That's Peter Viren, and he has defeated Corey Burkhart the in Belgian. two games. Yeah, from Belgium, and, and that puts him at 11-3, and three, Randy. And, yeah, he gets uh, to play a win and in next round. There you go. I, I think there's – no, I, I'm not even sure if there's a play to stay alive here. Can Wild Well, he slash? can chump block with the Dragon Master Outcast here. Yeah, but then you can't wild slash the den protector. I guess this is Jace coming down. The card he must have drawn that turn. Okay. But I think this is still just lethal on board, right? Well, Takahashi thinks so, as in <laughs> comes the team. And that does it. Yuta Takahashi improves to 11 and 3. Eric Severson on the ropes now. Yep. At ten and four, is going to have to win out and keep his fingers crossed yeah. here. Ten and four, but with good breakers. So a couple of wins, he could still, uh, could still maybe get it done. All right, let's move it over to the King of the Hill match, where we have Paulo Vitor Damodarosa with only one loss in the tournament, and he's up against Owen Turtenwald here with only two losses in the tournament. With only two losses. This board state's looking good for Owen, but yeah. uh, once we life totals? we'll have to find out life totals. That's what I was just going to say. Because that's uh, all the difference here. We're gathering that information for you now. Okay. Aha. Owen's at 11 and stabilized here. Remember, this is game three. Paulo won a quick game one. We got to watch Owen close out game two. And I mentioned it as we, as we left the table before, but this match has a lot of weight for Owen Turtenwald and honestly not as much for, for Paulo Vitor Damodarosa. Paulo poised to make his 10th career Pro Tour top eight. Owen would love to lock up number three. It's three, right? Yes. And, yeah, you know, Owen, Owen's up 15. for Hall of Fame uh, candidacy this year. Oh, he's so on the next th ballot. Yeah, oh. third top eight could be huge for him. Another nice play here for Owen Turtenwald. The life-linking Grandmaster. Yeah, we've seen the Grandmaster be a real thorn in the side here of, of the Atarka Red deck. Now, it doesn't interact super well with the sort of combo finish that we described earlier with Team or Battle Rage and such. But when it comes to this go wide plan, which they do, you know, play a lot. I mean, they play all of the little goblin makers, the dragon fodders, and the hordling outbursts. It really does a nice job of holding back a pretty shocking number of uh, of goblins. We we got to see John Finkel against John Stern last round. Yep. And and Finkel kind of played that like a violin. <laughs> all right, there's that hordling outburst. It looks like Paulo's just played this and shipped a turn back, and I think Owen's thinking on end step. Is that what you guys are seeing here? I think so. It looks like Owen's holding Crackling Doom Radiant Flames. Okay. Wow, 
wow, Radiant Flame Soulfire Grandmaster could be kind of insane. That it's is it's pretty absurd. Insane. He can't do it. He wants to do it for one. There's no way to spend three red with his board, is there? No, there is. If he spends red, 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 then he the converges gain. one, <laughs> all the goblins die, and he gains eight. like eight. Yeah. Oh, I see a uh, tap swamp there. So I guess he's going to lose his Soulfire Grandmaster. But make it gain 16 instead? So this is really wise from Owen. So he could have end of turn Crackling Doomed and then untapped and swept the board uh, Radiant Flames for one and attacked for lethal. But he's wisely saved the Crackling Doom in case there's a, a pump spell here like a Become Immense. Yeah. So Owen going for two to make sure he plays around a Tarka's Command and it works. Wow. And that's it. Owen Turtenwald wins his match here. Now, Randy, where does that put him? He just needs a draw. So he out of his next two rounds... A draw on either of them, and yeah. he's into top we've eight been, number you three. You know, just we've been saying Paolo is in. Now we can say Owen's in. Oh, my goodness. That this was is shaping up beautifully. This top eight's looking pretty good. So far, Paolo Vitor Damonarosa plus Owen Turtenwald. Not a bad start. Joining them will be the winner of this match. Now, this is the uh, the Ricky Chin. Versus Ryoichi Tamada. Exactly. Ricky's from Canada, and... We've got a handshake here, too, so it looks <laughs> like we came just in time. I didn't see who won. I'm going to assume that Ricky, Ricky wins. wins. Wow. First Pro Tour. First Pro Tour runs his lifetime Pro <laughs> Tour constructed record to 8-0. and He's never lost a match at the Pro Tour in constructed. First Pro Tour ever. And now he has all but clinched the top eight. We're going to call him in. Because all he needs is a draw. Might not even need that with a 12-4 probably sneaking in. All right, I got a question. Would you just stop? Like, take the just current quit? Top eight. No, just take your top eight and just walk away from the game? No. <laughs> I, I can say from experience, no. No, all right. <laughs> I was going to say, like, you could just say, never bothered to lose, <laughs> made the top eight solve this game and call it good. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't work quite so simply, but yeah. Great stuff down there in the feature match area. I know a lot of you are excited to see how the top eight shapes up, and as we hit up the next two rounds going forward, it is going to start to become crystal clear here. Um, we're actually going to set up for an interview as well, I believe, nice. with uh, with Ricky down there. Once I think he it's Owen, actually. Oh, interview. with Owen, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, get a word with him to see what's going on. Uh, in Owen Turtenwald's mind, I had a chance to chat with him uh, four rounds ago, so near the beginning of the day today, and it was typical Owen. You know, he was uh, short and sweet, you know, and just sort of said, I feel good. I'm okay. Uh, he had just come off of a win in the draft portion there, but I can tell you that he's feeling good, and uh, he should be should feeling be. great now, right? <laughs> All right, let's send it down to the feature match area where Tim Willoughby is with Owen Turtenwald. Welcome down to the feature match area floor. I'm here with Owen Turtenwald now. That last round, of course, as you get closer to the top eight of any pro tour, things get a little bit tense. And if you have to play someone, that guy that just walked past our camera, Paolo Di Vittor Damodarosa, a tough opponent and a tough deck to play against in general. How do you say your matchup goes there? Uh, I think the matchup generally favors me, but uh, it's, it's, it's a frightening matchup to play because they can just deal you 20 damage on turn four. And I mean, he's a Hall of Famer, excellent player has 10 Pro Tour top eights. You don't get 10 Pro Tour top eights losing important matches like that. So you know sitting down that you're probably not going to have the best of it, but had good draws and made the best of it. Yeah, and I guess that one thing that the deck that you have has going for it is there's a lot of life gain in there. I mean, especially, like, how good is Ojitai's command now in this field? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Were you expecting any answer other than just great? I mean, not really, but certainly the fact that you can get back Soulfire Grandmaster and like the play with uh, Soulfire Grandmaster and Radiant Flames there in the latter stages of that game means that effectively you're working off what, like 30 odd life in a match like that? I would have had the ability to gain about 30 life, but the best part about it against him was that it made him tap his mana and lose a life from using a fetch land so that I could have the kill in my hand. So it wasn't the 30 life that it was attractive, it was him using all of his cards so that I could win the game. <laughs> Absolutely makes sense. Now this... Assuming that it's locked, you know, I never like to say for sure any of these things, but it looks pretty good, would be your third top eight. What does that mean for you overall in terms of your career? Well, it would be cool. I would win at least $10,000, <laughs> maybe $40,000. So I'm hoping to try to win that. Makes sense, of course. Had a great run at Worlds and third Pro Tour top eight. I mean, at some point, this is the season where you become live for Hall of Fame voting, right? 
I am eligible for that this year, I believe. Exciting times. A Pro Tour win would certainly not be too bad on that front, but I'm going to send things back to the news desk now from the feature match area with Owen Turtenwald. All right, thanks very much. Uh, Tim Well will be there with Owen Turtenwald, keeping everything nice and calm. He's very good at that. Uh, made it to the final of the World Championship, uh, said very publicly he thought he was the best player in the world uh, and you know, came up one game short, obviously, um, and uh, Seth Manfield claimed that title. But great job by Owen. He is at 12-2, and two, along with Paolo Vida de Rosa. Now, remember, if you're new to coverage, you're very welcome. When we say they're locked for top eight, it doesn't mean they've been awarded a spot in the top eight yet. There are two rounds to go. It's just that we imagine that at some point in the next two rounds, they will be able to shake hands with someone who is also on 36 points, 12 wins, and they will get one point each for what we call an ID, an intentional draw, and that is worth one point to each of them. And the math just says, because you play someone on the same record, the 33s naturally play someone on 33. The 30s play someone on 30. It means that basically at 37 points, you cannot be caught by more than eight people. So they, you can't be knocked down far enough. So that's why we say we think Paolo and Owen are your first two into the top eight. Stranger things have happened. Nothing is certain until the final answer. But great job by both of them. Uh, Yuta Takahashi, now he is at 11 and three, having beaten the overnight leader, Eric Severson, who is two and four today. But this morning, we had a chance to talk with Yuta Takahashi, the king of the fairies, as we like to call him. You'll find out why in this interview. All right, I am here with hey. Yuta Takahashi. Yuta, welcome. You yeah, can, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Sit back. Easy chairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yuta, when was your first pro tour? My first pro tour is pro tour 2005. Uh, which one? Was it Los uh, Angeles? Uh, yeah, Los Angeles. Uh, Antoine Luel wins, Saikatoku. Uh, with Saikatoku. Yeah. 2005, you has been playing on the Pro Tour. Yeah. Um, have you played the whole time from 2005 to now? Uh, a few Pro Tour I don't join, but uh, yeah, 80% I, I join. Pro 80%? Yeah. Uh, is, is Magic your job? No, um, my job is card shop employee. You're a card shop employee. Yeah. How do I do? Ah, <laughs> and when you qualify for the pro tour, you get to come play. Uh, I I win GP Kyoto this year. Yeah. Oh, congratulations! In, in legacy format with miracles. With miracles. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Now, I asked you about your Twitter. Today, what's your Twitter name? Uh, my Twitter name is Vendilion. Vendilion? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Uh, when I top eight, uh, GP top eight my deck, every deck has Vendilion. Every deck has Vendilion? <laughs> that is great. Is it your favorite card? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorites, too. I love yeah. that card, too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what are your goals for the Pro Tour? Hmm? Hall of Fame, hmm. win... Just keep playing. Now, just win, uh, become champion. Champion? Yeah. yeah, that's a good goal. Takashi, thank you so much for your yeah. time. Thank good you. luck in the tournament. Yeah. Well, Yuta Takahashi uh, doesn't need a lot of help. He won, as we say, this round. He's at 11 and 3. So if he wins his penultimate round, coming up in a little bit, that would be 12 and 3. And then he would look at the math, see whether he could shake hands with someone again to get to 37 points. We think that is the magic, no pun intended, number, taking you to 37. So we've still got round about 10 minutes left on the round. I'm looking out beyond the camera, looking at the round clocks, just over eight minutes, and you've got it on your screen as well. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take you to a recorded feature we made on Thursday with one of the most popular players the game has ever seen, Louis Scott Vargas. And we wanted to find out what testing had been like. You know, what decks did they, they look through? What did they choose? Why did they decide what the options were? Uh, so we're going to take you inside that process now. Now, we are in uh, Wisconsin here, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but I'm still not sure this is quite right. Um, it's time now for the Pro Deck Dairy.
Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tournament Center here at Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar, Milwaukee. I'm Brian David Marshall, and I am joined by Pro Tour Hall of Famer <laughs> Luis Scott Vargas, better known the worldwide simply as LSV. Luis, welcome to the Tournament Center. Uh, we brought you here today to talk about Standard and like what goes into building a deck for a Pro Tour. Yeah, and today we're recording this on Thursday. This is the day before the Pro Tour, so I, I get to say a lot of things about decks that I don't even know which one I'm going to play yet. <laughs> you, you, so you still, like, even we're, we're, we're less than, maybe about 12 hours away from you having to turn in your list and all, and all that kind of good stuff. How, how can that be that you could be this close to there and still not know which deck to play? Well, a big part of testing for the Pro Tour is playing enough games with all the different decks and all the different cards so that at the end, you know, 12 hours before the Pro Tour, you can make decisions without having to go and retest a bunch of stuff because you don't have time for that, you know. 12 hours, I want to get eight hours of sleep. That does not leave me a ton of time to make decisions based on playtesting. It's more that we know which cards are good against which decks and we know how these specific decks interact and then at the end, a lot of the changes you make are just based on that. And, and how, how much of that's also getting a feel for what people are talking about and like how, how much intel do you soak up in those last hours before pro tour uh not a ton people are pretty closed mouthed these days for for good reason and a lot of the lists that you'll see online are not not representative of the lists you'll exactly see in the pro tour some are i mean you can definitely get good information by looking at like magic online results for example but we expect people to have a little bit different decks than what we see there so a lot of it is just trying to estimate what we think is going to show up and then you know maybe tune the last couple slots against it you worked with uh, Team Channel Fireball, obviously, as you have since for the last half a decade, but it was kind of a slightly different lineup or a slightly <laughs> the same lineup, really. Tell, tell yeah. us about the team for this So event. even before there was a Team Channel Fireball, even before there was a Channel Fireball at all, uh, myself, Paul Chian, Josh Adler Layton, and David Ocho, we used to test for Pro Tours together. This is back when... People didn't have any idea who we were. We had very few results under our belts. That guy and, from know. Nationals. We we're certainly not qualified for all the Pro Tours, but that was our testing team. And we've kind of gone back to that. Uh, on top of the, those four people, we also have Eric Froelich and Matt Nass. So that, that's, that's our core. It's actually really small. We, we, this is a smaller team than normal because we wanted to test uh, locally in Denver where the three of us live. And, uh, you know, to that end, we did have some help from, like, Brandon Nelson and Michael Jacob, actually, uh, yeah. who, whose names you might recognize. Yeah. Because they, they, they pitched in even though they weren't coming to the Pro Tour. Convenient local gamers convenient like at work yeah <laughs> five of the six of those people i just named are you know you know work at the, the same place that, that's very, that's very nice so now you get to the through this testing process you know like two intense weeks and you're you're on the eve of the pro tour you have how many decks that you're you're, you're really going to choose from here well so the decks we're going to talk about we've got like four different decks these are the one the main ones we worked on what we're going to play is probably narrowed down to about two of these four decks so so everybody on the team is going to play one of two of these four decks in your mind? I think that uh, I think that we might have one exception to that, but I think in general, yes, everyone's going to play one of the one of the. There's two of these four decks, and everyone's going to play one of those decks. Okay. All right, let's take, let's take a look at what the output was here from Team Channel Fireball. So we're going to start with Jeskai. Uh, what are some of the new cards that come in for a Jeskai list like this, and and what are the cards that make it, you want to play a deck like this that might be leaving the format? So. Jeskai with black is going to be one of the most common decks at the Pro Tour, but this list is pretty significantly different than normal ones. Uh, this is like a Jeskai Mentor deck. We've got four Monastery Mentors, and then also four Seeker of the Way. So we're leaning really hard on prowess, and to that end, Magmatic Insight is a, is a big part of that. You know, one red discard a land, draw right. two cards. And that fuels your Treasure Cruises and Murderous Cuts because of, you know, the most impactful five cards in Battle for Zendikar, Prairie Stream, Smoldering Marsh, Sunken Hollow, <laughs> you know, combined with uh, the other two. And that lets these Jeskai decks play black cards in them and have a better mana base than they used to because your Polluted Deltas and your Flooded Strands and your uh, Bloodstained Mires can go get dual lands. I always find it interesting when we get to the first Pro Tour of a new season and there's a new set coming in, and a lot of times the big impact is cards from the previous set that maybe got squoes out in the middle. So maybe some of the cards right now that we, we don't see from Battle of Zendikar maybe a year from now, but you know, Monastery Mentor is a card that really, it's, it's done a little bit, but it hasn't really gotten its day in the sun yet. Yeah, and the reason Mentor is good here is because all the fetch lands make all the Delve cards better, all the Delve cards better make, all, make the Mentors better. 
And then another card that we're not playing currently, but it is going to be in most Jeskai lists, is Crackling Doom. And that's kind of like a new card, because <laughs> now all these decks can play it when they couldn't before. Specifically from Battle, we've got uh, two copies of Radiant Flames and two copies of Dragon Master Outcast, which they're going to be somewhere in the 75 for sure, as well as Dispels, which is actually really well positioned right now. It's yeah, not, not a card that, sweet. that always makes the main deck. It's a card I love having in the format, though. And so, and so Radiant Flames can, can do how much? It can do three damage. Most two. commonly, it does deals two, actually. Yeah. Because if you cast a Radiant Flames for two by paying like red, red, blue, or red, blue, blue, so you intentionally don't want to converge for three, your Seek of the Ways survive, your Monastery Mentor survive because oh, of prowess. That's awesome. And sometimes you even have a turn where you go like Magmatic Insight, Radiant Flames for three, and your Seeker survives. Uh, Dragon Master Outcast, talk about that card real so quickly. It's it's seeing playing a lot of Jeskai lists because of the combination of Ojutai's Command, Dragon Master Outcast, just a hugely powerful late game. You play this 1 1, or you even discard it to Jace, ideally. <laughs> And then at the end of the, oh, when, once you have six mana in play, at the end of their turn, you just uh, Ojutai's Commander right back into play and it starts making dragons immediately. It gives this deck a closer, which it was missing for a wow. while. I, I, and that's not a card I've heard people talking about a lot out of Battle for Zendikar, but it, it sounds when you. Oh, you're going to see a lot of dragons this weekend. Yeah. I, I think that you know we are not alone in, in summoning Dragon Master Outcasts. Awesome, awesome. Give this give this deck a likelihood score for you. This is currently the deck I'm most likely to play, and I think uh, there are a number of people on our team are going to play this deck. So okay. you're going to see some monastery mentors this tournament. <laughs> awesome. Okay, let's take a look at your your next option here, uh, rally. So, so what what does that mean? I, I assume rally. We, the ancestors? We, we call it rally. These are the, the functional names. You know, when you're testing, you don't yeah. want to get too elaborate. Yeah. But this is a rally the ancestors deck. So you're basically this is the only white card in the deck. You're splashing a double white card. You're paying, you know, four or five mana to bring back all your creatures from your graveyard into play until your next upkeep. What that does for you is it gives you a bunch of creatures to sacrifice to Nantuka Husk, which kills your opponent with Zulaport Cutthroat. Alternately, even if you don't kill your opponent, you can also draw a bunch of cards off Grim Hera Specs and then Elvish Visionary, scry a bunch with Catacomb Sifter, and even get a Jace back, and then you can flip Jace, and then the Planeswalker Jace doesn't go away. Right. So... This deck is, is very interesting because it uses Collected Company, Rally the Ancestors, and Jace, and a bunch of terrible creatures. That, that, is, <laughs> that is what this deck is. I mean, how often do you see Sadisi's Faithful running around? Sure. <laughs> uh, so Catacomb Sifter, though, a four of? Catacomb Sifter is really important because, first of all, it gives you two creatures immediately. So when you're getting beat down and you collect a company and rally it back, it's multiple creatures. Or you just cast it turn three. Also, the scrying is really good because often one rally won't kill your opponent. This isn't the rally decks of last season where you had Mogi's Marauder to give it Nantuko Husk haste and just kill them in one hit. Your creatures do one damage per with Zulu Port, per, port Cutthroat. You're, so you're not often 20 them. What you're doing is getting back, let's say, Sifter, Visionary, Husk, Cutthroat. That's already draining them for four or five damage and getting to scry a bunch to find your next rally to find Grim Harrowspecs to draw a bunch of cards. Jace can let you flashback rally or company. It's a very synergistic deck. This is the deck that uh, Matt Nass is going to play. <laughs> it's Jason 56 cards. Yes, we, we knew, well, three of the four decks we have today have four Jaces, and every deck everyone's considering at this point has four Jaces. Okay. Jace is just and, the best card and, in the format. And, and one of the big predators for Jace was Searing Blood at the, at the yeah, last Pro Yeah, Searing Blood's no longer with us. Yeah. So Jace, even though there's going to be a lot of uh, fiery impulses and wild slashes, Jace is, is still the best card. Give me a likelihood score on this deck. This yeah, is I mean, the, the deck Matt I'm second most likely to play. Okay, so, and the deck that Matt Nass is most Matt likely is to have played. 100%. He's <laughs> okay. locked in like three days into testing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take a look at some of the other options. Uh, so Esper, this is a deck that your, your team really put onto the map. At the, yeah, at the Dra last Pro Dragon Tour. Esper or Esper Dragons uh, in Brussels, you know, pro, that Pro Tour. A bunch of our team played it and did very well with it. I unfortunately was not one of those people. Yeah, but, but, but a handful of top 16s, top 17. Yeah, Josh, top 16. Uh, the overall win percentage was quite good, and that's because of the combination of Silumgar's Scorn, Foul Tongue Invocation, and Ojutai is just very powerful. And that remains true. If you look at this deck, it does not have very many cards from Battle for Zendikar in it. Scatter to the Winds is a, is a new card I see in there. Uh, and Complete Disregard. Yeah. But past that, the biggest impact, again, is the mana base. You know, Prairie Stream and Sunken Hollow means that you can actually play Esper. Esper Dragons used to not actually play white cards besides <laughs> Ojutai because you could cast it off Haven of the Spirit Dragon. Right. But now you can actually play cards like Utter End and, and white sideboard I, cards. Ojutai's Command seems like a big yeah. uh, a big upward mover, like just on the few well, lists we've seen already. Yeah, Jace is just becoming better and better, and Ojutai's Command per combines perfectly with Jace. Yeah. At this point, I do not believe any of us are going to play Esper. Paul Chion was the last champion. He, he, <laughs> he played it all online all day today and was just like, yeah, I don't think Esper's got it. Okay, so let's take a look at, at, at the last option here. Uh, this is Red Green Landfall, and it is pretty much what it sounds like. You know, uh, well, we just took every card that had Landfall on it. <laughs> Slide Runner, Side Leopard, Snapping Gnarled. Yeah. <laughs> 
And uh, Retreat to Valakut actually was a surprisingly good card yeah. in this deck. So this deck is very similar to the Atarka Red decks. It even has still Atarka's Command, Monastery Swift Spear, Abbot, and then the you know Berserk Bloodlust combo, Become Immense, and Teamer Battle Rage. A, a limited staple for yes. you, right? <laughs> yeah, that is actually true. Uh, <laughs> And this deck does that part of the deck better than the red decks do because it has naturally with slide runners and gnarlids, you know, these four power creatures just by themselves. And if you save up fetch lands, so you sack them all in the same turn, you can have five, five, uh, retreat to Valakut also stacks really well. The disadvantage of this deck is it doesn't interact. If you notice, there's not a single card in this deck that can remove an opposing permanent from the battlefield. So <laughs> we, we, you know, the, the, the only interaction it has is retreat to Valakut makes their creatures unable to block, which is actually very good. Right. That being said, I, d I think, because the, the Battle Rage Become Immense combo is so prevalent in the normal red decks, people are adjusting to that. We expect a lot of Murderous Cuts, we expect Surge of Righteousness, we expect Jeskai Charm. I don't think we want to play this deck in a field full of those. So at this point, we've moved on, and I don't think anyone's going to play this, this deck. Is, this is, but this is kind of one of your baseline decks, maybe, when you start testing. Yeah. Like, what is the field going to look like? What can people do? Yeah, this, when we wanted to see how good we were against red, we tested against a normal Atarka red list that just doesn't have Leopards or Gnarlids. But when we wanted to test this deck, you know, we found that it was pretty good even when it didn't draw its spells. All, any combination of lands and creatures, you end up with a one mana three threes and two mana four fours. The problem is this deck just didn't have enough interaction and I don't think the combo kill was good enough. Okay, all right, give me a prediction. If, if one of these decks is gonna make the top eight this weekend, which one will it have been? Oh, Rally for sure. Okay, all right, Luis Scott Vargas, thanks so much for coming and sharing your playtesting experience with us here at the Tournament Center. Diary, pro deck, diary. Hmm. Okay, uh, there we are. Thanks very much to Louis Scott Vargas for joining us uh, for that feature uh, on Thursday. Always great to get inside a big testing team. Talking of which, one of the best testing teams this weekend has been Team Eureka. That's capital E, capital U, European Union. Rika. That gives you a clue. Most of them are from Europe. And they're headlined uh, by one of the most popular men in Magic, uh, one of the commentators on the European Grand Prix circuit, Matej Zatelkai. And earlier in the tournament, BDM had a chance to catch up with Big Z. I am here with Matej Big Z Zatelkai. Matej, your team, Team Eureka, has had an absolutely fantastic showing here coming overnight, really dominating this tournament. Yeah, we. I think that the number was almost 76% win percentage uh, on day one in limited. Overall, we were still the leading team at, at around, I think, 64, 65%. So pretty good. I mean, that's pretty good. Are you surprised having that? I mean, you, you sat there, you tested with these guys, you put in a lot of the work. Uh, are you surprised to see it show up the way it has? In a way, no. We have a, like somewhat of a unique testing process, I would say. Uh, one of the good things is that you know, like none of like we have some two platinum players, you know, but we we don't have the egos that some other teams might have. So we actually there's a lot of teamwork involved, and it actually shows one of the things we do when we draft. We when we prepared for the draft, everyone drafted, made their own decks, played played it out. But then we oh, after every single draft, we laid out all the decks and spent at least three minutes talking about each of the decks and like which card overperformed, which underperformed, how was the archetype, which cards are important for that particular archety archetype. And I think it's very important, especially for, for this set, where it's more about drafting a, a deck, a synergy deck, rather than just efficiency. Well, wow, that's that's super insightful because if you go to some of the testing houses, there there's arguments, there's definitely egos that get thrown on the table, and you guys have been able to take that out for the most part. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's uh, yeah, we don't really argue. Like we always have some arguments, and we like come to a conclusion. And there's like no bad feelings, no nothing like this card is unplayable. You're you're stupid. Uh, get out of here. And no, there's nothing like that. So we, we try to be reasonable. Uh, what about for constructed? Um, yeah, we, we were testing a lot. Of, for, for us, just like last time, it was more about finding the, the key cards of the format. So we wanted to make sure, like, what is this format about? Which cards do we think are strong? And at the end, we, uh, we uh, narrowed down to three decks, which included the three cards we considered strongest for the format. And that was uh, Gideon, uh, Jace, and Silkwrap. So all our decks played four of each. Okay. So in the end, we, we played two different decks, but both plays four of each. All right. That's Big Z from Team EU Eureka. Good luck in the tournament, Big Z. Eureka. Uh, yes, great job uh, by Matei and the team. Now, uh, someone got in contact with me yesterday and said, you know what, 
we love seeing all these Hall of Famers in action, but we don't actually necessarily know a lot about them. We're new to coverage, we're new to magic, we've been playing in the last couple of years. And of course, the Hall of Famers, well, they have resumes going back at least 10 years, and in some cases, the best part of 20. Well, maybe not everyone at home knows that Zvi Moshevitz is arguably the greatest theorist, one of the greatest deck builders, one of the great players of all time. For all three of those reasons, he's in the Hall of Fame. And this morning, he was in the Easy Chairs talking to us about his life in magic. Here he is. Hello there, I am here with Hall of Famer Svi Moshewitz. Svi, welcome to the Easy Chairs. I see you've made yourself comfortable. Oh, they're very comfortable chairs. I like though. that, I like yeah, yeah, I like these chairs too. Um, Svi, I wanted to give kind of you a chance to let people at, at home know who you are and where you've come from. Now, you're a Hall of Famer. I think that anybody that follows a lot of magic knows who Svi Moshewitz is. That's not hard. But, you know, for somebody like me, I came back to magic 2008, 2009. I heard your name a little, a little back then. But really, you know, to me, you were one of the old school, hardcore, you know, pro tour players. And it took me a while to become familiar with your resume and such. So I wanted to give you a chance to let us know who, who you are. Yeah, I spent a decade playing Magic professionally. It's all I did in college. It's a lot of what I did in high school. And then once I got onto the tour, I just, that's what I did every week. I traveled to the new place. And then I got back and I played online and I wrote articles and I built decks. And that's how you get good. It's just you, you train, you train, you report back and you explain all your reasoning and you play all the time and you group with a lot of great groups. I was, you know, Mock Squad, Godzilla, Your Move Games, Pantheon until very recently. And those guys make you better, and those associations make you better. And I built a lot of great decks. Yeah, that was one of the things that I actually had a chance to chat with Eric Lauer. And uh, it was over dinner. And, you know, one of the topics of conversation that comes up pretty frequently around Eric for some reason is be best deck builders of all time. And your name was thrown out by him in a, in a very, very short list of these are the ones I'm considering. What has been deck building for you, you know, over the course of your career? It, to me, that was what the game was largely all about from the beginning, was this is your chance to do your thing, to, to, to make your mark, and to play the things you want to play and see how they go and, and make, the make them the best they can be. And I loved that everyone was forced to get out there and figure out how the game worked and what they wanted to do. And I bemoaned it when people started going on the internet and saying, oh, wait, I can just copy someone else's list because they're better at this than I am. And they started copying your list a lot. And then they started copying mine. <laughs> I, I started out, I actually sent an email to my team at the time, the Legion, and somehow Frank Cosimato had been CC'd on a bunch of our emails. And he's like, can I publish this? I said, okay. And then people liked it, and I thought, well, okay, I should keep writing stuff. And that's how you started writing? That's how I started writing. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> now, where has life brought you now? Um, wh wh where are you at with the Pro Tour now and how you approach all well, this I, I'm, I'm married. And I have a wonderful wife, Laura, and my son, Alexander, is a year and a half old. And we're going to have more kids. So I don't have much time because I'm starting, I'm starting a new job uh, next week, actually. And so it's very hard to like, stay in a house for a week and a half and be away from your child and do nothing but magic all of a sudden and take the, all your vacation days that way and so on. So I decided, you know, I love the Pantheon. These people are amazing magic players, but it doesn't work for me anymore. And so I went back, I founded a new team with a bunch of guys from New York and now a bunch of guys from Madison. And we hang out, we have fun, a lot of older people, a lot of people with jobs. Uh, but we've, we've, what we've learned is how to get very efficient use of our time. So we know how to look at a spoiler list, how to decide which of these decks are viable, which of these ideas could work, how to explore it, and how to get to a reasonable place in a reasonable amount of time and to use the information that flows to you over the course of the three week period. All right, well, see, thanks for taking the time and uh, good luck in the rest of the tournament. Thank you very much. All right, so okay, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. What? I have a response. First, I need to fetch something. Uh, so <laughs> I just want to let people know we're, we're waiting for magic to start. There's still like matches. People are digging in their heels here as we come down yeah. the stretch here of standard. People have dug their heels in and they're like, I am not going to lose here. And we, and a couple of matches have really gone on down the stretch. Right, they, they, they certainly have. Um, so let's see if we can give you some important ones. John Finkel is absolutely still alive in this tournament at 11 and three. I just had a very bold prediction from the floor. My, my good friend Mike Flores is like, just open mouthed. 
And I'm like, what, what, what's going on? He's like, I just realized what's going to happen. I just had a vision of the future. Okay. And he's like, John Finkel and Paolo Vitor D'Amadorosa are going to meet in the finals of this Pro Tour and play five games. He's like, it's... It's, it's written. He's like, that's just what's going to happen. Okay, Mike. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see if we add prognosticator to his many other talents. Uh, what we do know is that that's still live because John Finkel is at 11 and 3. And uh, Paul Rietzel, he was up some against results Patrick Chabin. Yeah, just drag it round the back. There we are. You can have a look at those. Um, that means all the results are in, which is great. Uh, Paul Rietzel was up against Patrick Chapin. They were at it hammer and tongs. Paul Rietzel wins that one, goes to 10, 3, and 1. So that's win and win. Win and win. In. Win, win. In. Yeah, that's absolutely clear. Uh, Martin Muller against Reed Duke was a match in the last round. Reed Duke fans, sorry, he has his fourth loss. Doesn't absolutely eliminate him, but Martin Muller with his win goes to 11 and 3. Uh, no one told Martin Muller it would be easy. <laughs> No, he just seems to play like it is uh, because he's had a fantastic run over the last year. Um, now 18 and just the real deal for sure. Uh, Takahashi is 11-3, you know, from the feature match areas. Severson down to 10-4. PV and Owen, 12-2 to recap. Chin, 12-2 in his first Pro Tour. Yeah, unbelievable. Which is totally crazy until you remember he's from Canada and the Canadians can apparently do anything. But you know what? He didn't work with any of the big Canadian teams. We did that interview with him. Mm -hmm. He worked, he basically, it's like, who did you work with? My friend. Sometimes our other friend came over. <laughs> we drafted a lot on Magic Online. Mm -hmm. We built all the best decks and played them against each other. You know, so... It can be done. You know, we talk about mm -hmm. the super team all the time, but it can be done. You can just come into a tournament and have be great. Yeah, and you look at someone like Peter Viren, um, who is at 11 and 3. Now, he would traditionally, if we go back four or five years, would have been part of that big Belgian team. Yes. Fried Mulders and, and co. and Jan Dwoz, who were totally stables. And, of course, Moraine with his four Pro Tour Top 8s, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, most of those have gone away into other facets of their life, whether that's coverage or just the wider world of work. Um, but Viren's still very much here and alive. And his weekend started with an absolute killer draft pod um, you know he came out uh, but basically huffing and puffing at two and one out of his <laughs> morning draft pod yesterday going yeah I'm looking at you know Kibler here and Jerry Thompson there and Hall of Famer there and great player there and I'm like two and one thanks very much he's Having navigated that, he saw that as an opportunity and he's only lost once, uh, twice since then, 11 and 3, a win in this penultimate round, that puts him in the tiebreak medley. Um, but it looks like you've got standings now. Why don't we take a look at our leaderboard, see whether that's up to date for you, um, and we'll see what we've got. We've got Paolo Vida Dama de Rosa on 36 points. He was there. Uh, for the last round. So he's 36. Ricky, Ricky Chin, mm -hmm. 36 points. You mentioned and Owen. Owen Turtenwald at 36 points. Yet looking here, everyone here has their 14th match in. So you've then got the 11 and 3. So they go from 4th through 9th. Right now, John Finkel doesn't want things to finish uh, because he is at 11 and 3 in ninth spot. This is in tiebreak order. Um, so... Finkel, Muller, Peter Vrien, we've mentioned. Paul Dean, this is a terrific story. He's had three Pro Tour starts since Proto Amsterdam in 2010, a 48% win rate from those three. Well, 11 and three, he's putting all his wins together in the right order. Much better to have, you know, a 48% after three and then go 11 right. than to be at like 53% through four starts. So a uh, good job by him. He defeated Luca Magni of Italy last round. That's Magni's fourth loss. Again, right on the verge. We're not sure who, if anyone, makes it in with four losses. Um, let's just take another look at the leaderboard if we can. John Stern is amongst the 10 and fours, currently uh, in 16th place. Brandon Burton still potentially alive at 10 and four there. Um, so and you said these are in tiebreak order. Eric, Eric so you're saying you see at the top of the 10 and fours. As he should be. Because he had, what, I, I think, was he 9 and 0 or 10 and 0? At 10, uh, he started losing, obviously. Uh, right, yeah. So he got to 9 and then uh, fell, fell back. Paul Rietzel, with that win over Patrick Chapin, is very much alive. Everyone from 11 up 
has their destiny in their own hands. Uh, they can certainly take care of that. Um, looking at pairings, because that obviously becomes very critical, um, Martin Muller at 11 and 3 is going to be up against Peter Viren at 11 and 3. So that's Dart Jeskai, which we've seen a ton of uh, for Muller up against Peter Viren Esper Dragons. Ooh. So that's what we'll see there. Paul Dean, his essentially, we think, win and in is up against Yuta Takahashi. So that's Abzan Mirror. That might oh, take wow. a while. Never know. See what happens with that. Um, Ricky Chin, uh, the king of the hill table, 12 and 2 uh, with green, white, megamorph. Owen Turtonwild, 12 and 2. Well, that looks to me like a draw right there. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if we put in someone else. Maybe Paul Rietzel with Esper Control up against the four color dragon's deck of Tiago Saparito, another Brazilian who's uh, right in the thick of things. Yeah, so it looks like for sure. Uh, Ricky Chin and Owen Turtonwild shake hands. Yeah, as, as you go as you go down the list a little bit below uh, Corey Burkhart, there's there's some big names there also, just at X and 4, Alexander Hain, Wang Ho Shan, Seth Manfield, Tiago Saprito, Sam Black, Fabrizio and Terry. Wait, it's a lot of the people we interviewed because they were national champions yeah. at the beginning of, of this tournament. Absolutely. But, you know, a really, a really packed... Uh, let Patrick Chapin, Calcano, just falling a little bit below that at 29, but just a, a, a star-studded top table. All, all those national champions, uh, they don't get to pick their teams because that's what the WMCQs uh, give them. Um, but we certainly have that story there of the Eureka team. They've done some things sort of quietly behind the scenes that may not be immediately apparent to people who are dreaming of being on a big team because I think to most people the starting point is be in a room with lots of very good people and play test lots. That's your kind of starting mission statement. But I think we're in an era of teams now, BDM, where we are starting to see teams be about more than that. Well, they're certainly about stability, right? You, you, you know, you want to find players who are, you know, I think if you're trying to qualify for the next Pro Tour, you probably want to be working with a lot of people trying to qualify for the next Pro Tour because the players who are looking to put up those consistent finishes and get gold, get platinum, because they want to keep that same group of people coming back each time. I mean, that, that's really the trick in, in, in team selection because it's very difficult. And not, not because... Just because you also want to have a, you know, you work with someone for one event, you want to know if they're good. You want to know that they're going to be back again. You don't want to have to constantly sort of reevaluate people. You want to have that chemistry. You want to have that shorthand. You want to finish each other's sentences and play test results. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think that that's a, a big part of it. You know, there was something very comforting for Luis coming back to the core Channel Fireball team for this, right? You know, we talked to him about it. And he was like, yeah, it was great. If these are the people that I've, I've worked with for so long. And he knows that he can shortcut a lot of things and he knows where people's shortfall strengths and weaknesses are hmm. so I, I think that there's something going on in terms of finding this group of european players who are going to be fixtures on the tournament scene that you know mate and uh martin Yuza and everyone else who's, who's who's working on that squad can go okay we know all these people will be coming back for a, a good chunk of them. And, you know, they've put up some, some great results. They put up, you know, posted, you know, three or four titles last year. You know, three paper titles, one digital title. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, just it's very, very important to have that consistency. Yeah, and we talk about chemistry uh, uh, as well. And the thing there is that fundamentally, if you're just thinking for yourself, the ideal team is you and a bunch of people who are better than you because then you learn from everyone up the chain. If you are in 11th place in your team of 11, you're learning from all 10 above you. But if everyone wants to do that, it's like a pyramid scheme. Somebody, somebody ends up going, wait, I'm the best player on this team. And that, of course, is part of the reason that Willie Adel is in the Hall of Fame, because he knows he's the best player on the team, and he doesn't care that he isn't playing with 11 players better than him. He actively wants to encourage Guillaume Medeos Merian, Thiago Saparito. Right. Uh, Paolo doesn't need any encouragement no, at this no. point, it's fair to say, but he did once upon a time. We forget that when Paolo was making the top eight of the World Championship in 2006, this is a guy who was like 15, 16, 17, you know, at the start of his career. He was a very young man indeed. And, and you know, that support was there. And Paolo said so in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, no, that was, that, that was amazing to me. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the opportunities Willie Eagles had as a team builder, you know, where they're like, hey, you know, 
Apollo speaks very highly of you. You know, you have the results. Why don't you come work with Team, Ch Team Channel Fireball, come to Vegas, play? I can't. I have to make sure these three guys who won the Brazilian PTQ and these two guys who won the Portuguese PTQ and these two guys who won in Chile have a team and we're going to meet and we're going to do our thing and I'm going to make sure that they all have their visas squared away. I'm going to make sure that they have you know, can benefit from my experience of traveling to a pro tour and, you know, are doing it correctly. It's just kind of a, kind of an amazing uh, thing to hear. You know, you, you really put into perspective like that selflessness of, you know, really sacrificing some of his opportunities to, you know, play with people maybe, you know, uh, you know, on a higher skill level than the people he played with normally, but you know that was more his priority. Hmm. Magic is a game of cycles, and different countries come and go. Right now, we've got Scandinavia doing fantastically well with the likes of Martin Dan and, and, and Yoel Larsen. Um, Japan has not been in a great place uh, for a few years, certainly compared to the, its real heyday of back to back to back to back players of the year 2005 to 2008. But if we take a look at the leaderboard again, you'll see three Japanese names right in the thick of things right now. So you could easily see Yuta Takahashi, Ryoichi Tamada, and Kazuyuki Takemura in the top eight. And looking at Takemura, boy, is this someone who's ever learnt their lessons. First Pro Tour, journey into Knicks at Atlanta 2014, two and five, but since then, 11-5 Fate Reforged, 11-5 Dragons of Tarkir, and here he is, maybe on the brink of the top eight. Would you like some good magic, Brian David Marshall? I would love some great magic. Okay, let's see if I can give you Paolo Vita Dama de Rosa against John Finkel. That's not a strong enough word. I need a, a stronger word than great. Let's do that now. <laughs> 